his joy this day because we have come into the house of the Lord. Let us stand together now as you are able as we join in these words of call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. God delights in his flock and leads us into the kingdom of heaven. Let us now confess these things which we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Once again, we have the opportunity to perform the sacrament of baptism, and, uh, and uh, we're going to do that in just a moment. But before we do that, uh, Doug and Amy Green are going to join the church here. Uh, they're not actually members right now, but they're just about to be members, and then they'll answer the questions for the baptism. And so, Doug, Amy, I have several questions uh, for the two of you, or at least two. First of all, uh, do you confess your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And will you be loyal to Christ and allow your loyalty to Christ to find expression right here at Dunwoody United Methodist Church through your prayers, your regular attendance, your financial gifts, your service in the church, and your witness to the world? Will you do that? Okay, God bless you. And, and we're going to ask you at the end of the service to join us uh, at the door of the church and give everybody a chance to come by and welcome you and greet you uh, into the life and fellowship of the church. Uh, and now we're going to uh, participate in the baptism of this little guy. Absolutely. Dearly beloved, baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which grace we become partakers of his righteousness and heirs of life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament are thereby in, uh, marked as Christian disciples and initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Our Lord Christ has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God, which holy privilege must not be denied them. So remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. So once again, I have some questions to ask you. I've already asked you the question, do you confess your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? So do you therefore accept as your bounden duty and privilege to live before this child a life that becomes the gospel? to exercise all godly care, that he be brought up in the Christian faith, that he be taught the holy scriptures, and that he learn to give reverent attendance upon both the private and the public worship of Almighty God. Will you do that? Will you endeavor to keep him under the ministry and guidance of the church until he, by the power of God, shall accept for himself the gift of salvation and be confirmed as a full and responsible member of Christ's holy church? Will you do that? May I have him, please? What name is to be given this child? Preston Vincent, Preston Vincent Green. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to take him out. Uh, you can't have him back just yet. <laughs> I'm going to actually take him out here and give the congregation a chance to see this little guy, this guy that has now become an official part of our congregation that, that we've taken some responsibility for that at least I'm going to ask you to take responsibility for in just a moment. And, and we're going to have a chance to help raise him in the Christian faith and, and to help influence him for Jesus Christ. And 
And we can do that in all sorts of different ways, teaching Sunday school classes, being in church on Sunday morning, uh, uh, through the ministry of giving, and, and all of these different ways we help to influence him for Christ. So if you will do all in your power to help influence him for Christ, will you simply say with me, with God's help, we will. With God's help, we will. Kathy, would you pray for us, please? Let us pray. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, grant that Preston Vincent, as he grows in years, may also grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that by the restraining and renewing influence of the Holy Spirit, he may ever be a true child of thine, serving thee faithfully all his days. So guide and uphold Amy and Doug, that by loving care, wise counsel, and holy example, they may lead Preston into that life of faith whose strength is righteousness and whose fruit is everlasting joy and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I have his baptismal certificate in here and also there's a letter that I'd like to ask you to have him open on his 12th birthday. Will you do that? Thank you. God bless you. You may be seated. pastors here this morning and if you are here visiting for the first time if you are a first time guest we have a special gift for you that we will give you after the service at the welcome desk right outside this door or outside those doors behind you so if you will stop by there before you leave today and I'll ask everyone to find the fellowship pads that are in your pews they'll be at the end closest to the center aisle if you will register your attendance here that way those worshiping with you down the aisle will know who's seated with them and make sure you speak to each other before you leave today today is or monday tomorrow is veterans day so we'd like to take a moment to recognize any veterans that we might have with us this day if you are a veteran if you would stand now and let us show our appreciation for you We thank you so much for your service. Just a few announcements really quick. Next Sunday at 4 o'clock is our organ dedication and concert. You won't want to miss that. 4 o'clock next Sunday afternoon here in the sanctuary. And then earlier that day is our consecration Sunday where we will have um, time to to offer our gifts back to God, our pledges back to God. And then after each service, or after Sunday school, after the Sunday school hour at about 11 o'clock, we'll have a complimentary lunch, and then a second seating after this service next Sunday. So all is complimentary free, but we do, we do encourage you to make a reservation so we know how many to cook for. So with all of those announcements, I will let you enjoy these beautiful children.
I'm going to join these awesome kids. And if there are any other children who are with us today and would like to join me up here for a moment, I would love to have you come join us. Hi. It's so good to see all of your faces today. And I'm glad that you could be here in worship. Um, didn't their friends do a wonderful job singing? I think they did a wonderful job. So today we're going to talk about kind of a big word that you may have never heard before, but you might have heard it. The word is stewardship. Have you heard it? You ever heard that word before? Yeah, that's right. It's a word that we don't use a whole lot in our lives. We just kind of use it at church. But there is this idea of stewardship, which means taking care of things. There are lots of things in our lives that we take care of, right? What are some things that we take care of? Do you want to? What do we take care of? Yeah, if you're if you're at a if you're a parent, you take care of children. Does anybody have any pets they take care of? Yeah. What about your rooms? You take care of your rooms, you keep them clean, keep them tidy, make sure nothing's falling apart. How about you? What do you take care of? Of your toys, yeah. They're things that you love, and you, so you take care of them. So this season at church, we are talking about stewardship of the church. What do you think are some of the ways that we take care of the church? What do you think? Yeah, we keep it clean. We keep it clean. What else do we do to take care of our church? What do you think? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we take care of the organ pipes. We get those tuned for sure. Absolutely. There are lots of things that we do to take care of our church. Part of, some of the things that we do are to be a part of ministries that are important in the church, right? Um, we couldn't take good care of Sunday school if nobody went to Sunday school, right? Couldn't do that. We also take care of church by praying for each other, by showing love to one another, and by giving of our gifts so that the church can stay strong and continue to show us Jesus' love. So this week, I want you to think about what you can do. Each one of you has special gifts. What can you do to help take care of this church and be a good steward of the gift that God has for us? I want you to think about that all week, and then you can bring it back to us next week, okay? Let's pray together. I will say a couple of words, and you repeat after me. And in that way, we all pray together. You guys can join in too if you want. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the gift of your church. Help us to be good stewards of all that you have given to us. <laughs> Amen. Now, friends, um, those of you who would like to attend Children's Church are welcome to actually come with me and Miss Marianella, and we'll head to our own Children's Church and worship together. Let's go. Let me try this once more. Just as Calissa uh, was talking about stewardship, we're going to have a stewardship moment as well. And I'm going to ask Fran Miller, who is the chair of our uh, stewardship committee, to come forward and to say a few words about it. Well, that's all right. You, hey, you can come sit with me if you like. Would you like to do that? Do you want to go? All right. I'm so sorry. I'll take you. I'll take her for a while. No. Don't, don't go away for a long time. <laughs> you want to go back? <laughs> Here you go. Go wait. ahead, Dan. I'll do the sermon. Okay. <laughs> Get to follow the kids. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> you know, interesting enough, Cindy Morrison said it best to me. They are the church. They are the future of the church. 
And that's why stewardship matters. And Cindy was absolutely right when she told me that. You know, last week uh, I stated that we needed you to, to pledge in order to develop and manage a realistic budget. Talked about the fact that now in the pews of the little laminated cards, we got in the 21st century, you can give online, you can text, etc. And people today, they write checks still, but a lot of times people are now giving stock. They f figure that's a good way to support the church. But to me, pledging also says something a lot more than that, that you're part of something larger than just yourself. When you sign a pledge card, you're saying that you believe in what we're doing at Dunwood United Methodist Church. I guess the popular phrase is, we're all in. I'm not naive. The Methodist Church is in a state of flux. But we're talking about the 2020 operations budget for this church. It's the church that you worship at each and every week. You know, the Methodist Church, and Dunwoody Methodist particularly, is an integral part of my life. I have two daughters that live here in town, Lisa Biger and Meredith Jameson, and their families, and they attend this church. Lisa's on the staff of the preschool, and Meredith is the assistant admissions director over at the Wesleyan School. Many of mine and Mary's friends are in this audience as I look out at the congregation. Of course, they all like Mary better than me, but I'll get over it. But over the years, the more I've been involved in this church with my time and my financial resources, the more satisfaction I seem to get. I don't know if this is what people call the mystery of faith. I know one thing, as I've gotten older, my priorities have evolved. And more than ever, I believe I have a better understanding of what really matters in one's life. I can assure you of this, and don't get me wrong, I still love doing a business deal, still love winning at golf, as I did yesterday, I might add. But giving of yourself and then your resources is probably as good as it's going to get. And next Sunday, we thought you will think and pray about it and respond accordingly on Commitment Sunday. Kathy mentioned the fact that we're going to have two sittings for lunch next week, one after the Sunday school hour and one at, after this service. The good news is it's free. And uh, we'd like to see you attend. If you please register with the church, it would be much appreciated. When I took this position of stewardship for one year, I realize that our current environment is very unsettling for a lot of people. But I've watched this church in the past step up and meet a challenge. And we're coming off a three-year building program. Case in point, the organ, what you're looking at around us here. And I'm going to give you an example with my basic liberal arts education. Assume you gave $15,000 over three years to this church for the building fund, $5,000 a year. I'd like you to consider saying, okay, $5,000 I gave for the building. I'll give 30% of that this year, $1,500. I'll add it to my normal operations pledge. Again, I believe that probably means this church would net another half a million dollars, which allows us to continue the present ministries and expand our, current, and expand our ministries. I'm going to close with this. Last week, for those of you who weren't here, I plagiarized a proverb from a Methodist minister that Church was, you know, church was free, but you had to pay for parking. I'm going to be a little more serious this week. When you pledge to the church, to this church, you empower your church. But more importantly, with what this church does, it empowers you. Thanks be to God.
At this time, we bring before the congregation the concerns and celebrations that you'll find on page six in your worship bulletin. We lift up the Green family this morning on Preston Vincent's uh, baptism. We also lift in Christian sympathy and our love, Julie and Jeff Ackerman, on the death of her father, John. To the family and friends of Nancy Speck on her, of her death on October the 31st. To the family and friends of Mary Rogers on her death on November the 6th. To the family and the friends of Velma Griffith on her death on November the 6th. Velma's service will be held here in the chapel of our church next Saturday, November the 16th. The service will be at 2 p.m. and visitation will be with the family at 1 p.m. before the service. We lift before God now those concerns and all the concerns of our hearts as we go to God in a time of prayer, in a time of silent prayer, in a time of pastoral prayer and Lord's Prayer. Let us pray together. Oh, Lord God, it is through your Son that you tell us not to be afraid of what the future holds, not to worry about tomorrow, but you know how that is so difficult for us to hear those words. For we worry about many things, our families, our friends, our circumstances. Some of those worries are big worries. Most are worries that are tiny worries. We come before you this day with those big and tiny worries and with the confidence we know that you can lay them aside. We bring our big worries about health and happiness and security for ourselves and for our loved ones. We bring big worries about the world we live in and its future as we continue to fail to address the so many problems that we have created. We bring big worries about those who are mistreated, exploited, and abused. Oh God, we know that you are concerned about every aspect of our lives. So we also bring those little things that concern us, the worries which keep us awake at night, the worries which only you know. Oh living God, we ask that you reach out to each of us for whom the future brings fears and uncertainties. Assure us that you are with us even when the future seems somewhat dark and circumstances feel like they're spiraling out of control. Remind us that you are able to transform even the bleakest of situations, that you will bring healing and wholeness. We make our prayers in faith for we know that your spirit is at work in our world, making all things new just as your son promised. And he taught us to pray also saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. wallets that don't wear out, a treasure in heaven that never runs out, 
No thief comes near there, and no moth destroys. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be too. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Will you bow with me for just a moment of prayer? Our gracious and loving God, now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you. O Lord, our strength and our everlasting redeemer. Amen. You may recall last Sunday, we eased into both our stewardship campaign and a series of sermons with the title, Gifts That Endure. 
Now, I say we eased into it because last Sunday we had a lot going on. It was the day after the holiday festival. It was All Saints Sunday. We had communion. And the choir sang several pieces from Duraflay's Requiem. So we didn't really have a chance to, to talk much about it. But Fran did come and he introduced uh, the stewardship part of the campaign, and, and in my sermon, you remember, I, I ask us to consider the question, what, would you, what are you going to do with what has been given to you in the time that you have been given? Now, as you've already been able to tell, this morning we're wading a little bit deeper into not only the campaign, but also into this series of sermons, and as it relates to the series of sermons, the way I want to wade into it a little bit deeper is by looking at those words of Jesus that we read in our lesson. Make for yourselves wallets that do not wear out. It's kind of interesting because when I was preparing this series of sermons and I ran across those words of Jesus, my mind immediately darted back about 30 years ago to when my son Christopher was just a, a little guy. It was about three weeks before Christmas, and I had a wallet that was threadbare. I mean, it was ripped, and it was torn, and probably a lot like many of you in this place, my wallet is sort of my portable personal financial portfolio. I carry a little bit of everything in it. I, I, I have a little bit of cash. I, I carry my credit cards and my driver's license and my insurance cards. I, I keep receipts in there and I have notes and I have business cards and I just have all sorts of stuff and I never really go any place without my wallet. Well, I'd kind of hinted to Carol that uh, I would like a new wallet for Christmas. And, uh, but around our house, Christmas gifts are just sort of this very secret thing and, and around our house just because you hint at wanting something doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get it. I mean I've been hinting to Carol for years that I'd like a 30-foot sailboat but so far that still hasn't happened. Anyway my son who was then about four years of age uh, one morning I had, was getting ready to go to church. I'd finished shaving and I was just getting ready and my son spotted my wallet sitting on my, my night table next to the bed and he went over and he picked it up and, and he brought it over to me and as only a four-year-old can say, he said, Daddy, you're not going to have to worry about this old wallet anymore. Me and Mama got you a brand new one for Christmas. <laughs> and so now, every year, about three weeks before Christmas, I say to Christopher, what's Mom getting me this year for Christmas, you know? Make for yourselves wallets that do not wear out, said Jesus. And you remember when Jesus made that statement, he was talking to a large crowd of people. Luke tells us that there were literally thousands upon thousands of people who, who had gathered there that day. And Jesus had been teaching about a variety of things when all of a sudden someone stepped from the crowd, explained that there had been a death in the family, and that the conversation about the inheritance between he and his brother was not going very well. Would Jesus please intervene? And in response, you remember Jesus replied by saying, be on guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then to stress his point, Jesus went on to tell a story about a foolish hoarder. And to remind his disciples not to worry about what to eat or what to wear because God already knows your needs even before you ask. And that's when he made the statement. That's when he said, make for yourselves wallets that don't wear out. Now what do you suppose Jesus was trying to get us to see? Personally, I think that at least part of what he was doing is he was challenging us to think about what's really important, what really matters, what is really lasting in life. You know, so much of what surrounds our lives is temporal, isn't it? The houses we live in, the cars we drive, the clothes we wear, uh, the work we do, the organizations that we belong to, country clubs, civics or organizations, even the trophies we, we collect. 
the, there's nothing wrong with any of these things, of course, for the most part. They're all good, but none of them are ultimately going to last. The houses we live in one day are going to either collapse or they're going to be torn down. The cars are going to end up in a junkyard. Uh, the clothes we wear are going to wear out. There's going to come a time when we're no longer going to need to belong to a country club or a, a civic organization or even uh, a work. And yet, and yet, if you look at where many of us have our lives invested, that is, where we spend our time, where we spend our money, you find that these are the sort of things that just sort of gravitate to the center of our lives. In fact, the reality is that the more we have in our life of these sorts of things, the more likely these things are to kind of gravitate to the center of our lives. The reason? Houses need repair. Cars need maintenance. You know, uh, organizations that we belong to demand our time, and so forth. And so again, there's nothing wrong with any of these things, but the more we have of them, the more there's this temptation to make them go right to the center of our lives. Now, Jesus knew this. One day, a young millennial came running to him. And this guy had already begun to climb the corporate ladder. He had already accumulated a lot of things. But in the process, he had discovered that just adding things on the outside wasn't giving him the happiness that he yearned for on the inside. And so he asked Jesus a very legitimate question. He said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, well, you know the commandments. Don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness. And about that time, this young man interrupted. And I imagine he did it with a smile. He said, teacher, I've already been keeping all of those ever since I was a young person. And Jesus replied, you still lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And we're told that when Jesus said that to him, his countenance fell. And he went away with his head down because his possessions had already begun to possess him. This can happen to us so subtly that we barely even notice that it's happening. In fact, to kind of illustrate my point, I want us to engage in a little bit of an interactive activity for just a moment. I'd like to ask you, if you would, to just reach in your back pocket, if that's where it is, or reach in your purse, if it's in your purse, and just take out your wallet for a moment. Would you do that? Just reach in and hold it in your hand for a moment. Everybody got it? Now I want to ask you to do something. I want to ask you to give it to the person next to you, preferably not your wife or your children. You can keep your eyes on it if you want to. And by the way, if this exercise is going to cause you to go into AFib, there's no need for you to participate. <laughs> okay, everybody exchange it. Now, I'd like to invite the ushers to please come forward if they would. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just kidding. But let me ask you a question. Suppose I did invite the ushers to come forward. Suppose I invited the person next to you to just take out your wallet and open it up and take whatever they wanted and throw it in the offering plate. How would that make you feel? Some of you are thinking, I really wish the person next to me would open my wallet, see how little there is in it. Maybe they'd put something back into it for me. But how would it make you feel? A little anxious? If you have a lot in there, would it make you feel a lot anxious? Here's the point. The more we have, the more there is this tendency for the things that we have, the money that we have, all of that stuff to, to gravitate to the center of our lives. Okay, you can give the wallets back and you can check to make sure it's all in there. All of this naturally begs the question, doesn't it? What really matters in life? 
What's really important? What is lasting in life? You know, you only have to look at the life of Jesus to see what's really important. You only have to watch him as he gathers a ragtag band of disciples together and, and lives with them for three years to try and teach them how to live and love and to grow in their faith. You have only to watch him reach out to the poor and the marginalized. You have only to listen to his response to John the Baptist's disciples when they came to him to ask him a question you, one day. You remember John the Baptist had been arrested and was in prison and doubts had begun to form in his mind and so he had sent two of his disciples to Jesus to ask the question, are you the one who's to come? Are you the Messiah or should we look for another? And you remember how Jesus replied? He said, hey, go tell John what you see and what you hear. The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, for the dead are raised and the poor have good news preached to them. So what really matters in life? What really matters in life, what, what's lasting, what's important. Love matters. People matter. Discipleship matters. Growing in your faith matters. Which is where you and I come in. You see, in our lesson this morning, Jesus is inviting us to help make these things happen by becoming a part of the rhythm of God's divine generosity. In our lesson this morning, Jesus reminds us that God takes delight in giving the kingdom to us. So think for just a moment about all of the good things in your life. Think maybe about this church. Think about your Sunday school class and, and what it means to you. Think of a time when maybe you were sick or you were in crisis or you were in the hospital and, and the church reached out to you. Think of a worship service that you sat in where, where a moment of truth happened for you. Think of those for just a moment. Think, think maybe of your family. And how much they love you and how much joy they bring to you. Think, think of your friends and how rich your life is because of them. And now remember that every good thing in your life, every good thing is a gift of God's divine generosity. When Jesus says, make wallets for yourselves that don't wear out. Jesus is inviting us to live into that generosity by becoming channels of it to other people. In fact, that's actually part of the way that God created us. We're created to be channels of his generosity. The other day I was doing a little bit of research on generosity, as you would imagine, and I ran across a research paper that was written by Dr. Summer Allen. She's a professor at the University of Berkeley, and, and uh, she did a study through the John Templeton Foundation on the science of generosity. And it's about a 60-page paper. You can find it on the internet. But uh, just a couple of things that really stood out to me that I wanted to share with you. She discovered that on the whole, humans are a generous species and that generosity has its roots not just in our individual development, but also in our very biology and evolutionary history. In other words, that humans are actually biologically wired for generosity. That kind of flies in the face of, of some of the studies that have suggested that, uh, it, you know, our basic makeup is one of self-interest. She's saying we're wired for generosity. She discovered that children as young as 14 months old, even before they can fully communicate with people, have this innate drive to help other people. And she discovered that generosity is associated with better overall health in older adults, Delayed mortality, better psychological health, more happiness, and longer lasting romantic relationships. So the way I read that is that if you want to live longer, feel good, be happy, and have romantic relationships, write a very large check to the church. 
actually what I think she's saying here. Is she saying that, that generosity starts in the heart and mind of God and that it is built into the very fabric of who we are as human beings, that we can't really be fulfilled unless we allow generosity to flow through us. That brings us to the subject of the church. As, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, and as you've heard all through this service, we're in our Gifts That Endure campaign right now. And so this week, as I was thinking about all of this, I started thinking about some of the ways that your generosity has helped to make wallets that don't wear out. And I started thinking about a letter I got some weeks ago from a young person in this church. And I, I wish I could just share the whole story with you, but it's a little bit personal. But what I can tell you is that there were some circumstances in this young girl's life that were very difficult. And, and, but this church stepped in. And because of your generosity, she had what she referred to as a life-changing experience. I thought about some of the organizations that, that this church supports that care for the elderly and for children and for the hungry and the homeless. I, 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 did you know that this church this year gave a record amount of money to uh, Wesley Woods? and leads the entire conference in the giving for the Mother's Day offering. And, and this church led the way in the entire conference. This is an organization that cares specifically for the elderly. Did you know that we're on track to lead and, and make a record gift to Wellroot, or what was formerly called the Children's Home, an organization that cares specifically for the needs of children? Did you know that we're one of the leading churches, if not the leading church, in our giving to Action Ministries, a, a, an organization that is specifically geared to care for the hungry and for the homeless? And in part, these things have happened because of your generosity. I thought about our children's ministries and our youth ministries and our young adult ministries and our senior adult ministries. I thought about our music program. We have an amazing music program, don't we? Children's choirs, youth choirs, our chancel choir, our band for the contemporary service. It is second to none. I thought about last Sunday's services and how after the services were over, and this was true of all three services, I, I, I thought about how Several people came up to me, some of them with tears in their eyes, telling me how much the service had meant to them. And that reminded me of other services we've had through the year where lives have been touched, decisions have been reached, and healing has occurred. And, and all of that happened because of your generosity. I, I thought about some people this last year who have been in the hospital and others who have had various kinds of crisis in their lives. And I thought about how our clergy were there to be able to go to them and to visit with them and to care for them and to remind them of God's healing presence. I know some of you have done some of that as well, but our clergy were able to be there. And that's because of your generosity. I, I could go on and on with the things that we do in this church, but here's the point. The ministries of this church are solely dependent upon your generosity. Other organizations, country clubs, civic organizations, they, their dues, they can require you to pay. We don't do that in the church. The church exists and, and the ministries are made possible because of your generosity. And so I want to be so bold as to ask you to do something. I want to ask you when you leave here this morning to prayerfully and carefully consider your giving to the church for this next year. And then next Sunday, don't sit it out because it's Consecration Sunday. Actually come to church. 
uh, fill out your pledge card. Or we'll have some available if, if you've lost it, but fill out your pledge card. Put it on the altar as a symbol of your commitment to Jesus Christ through Dunwoody United Methodist Church. And then we'll all go and have a meal together. Sound good to you? It does to me. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 399, Take My Life and Let It Be, Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. As we sing this hymn, if there's anyone here this morning who would like to join this church, whether by a profession of your faith or transfer of your membership, Doug and Amy already transferred their membership from the Cathedral of St. Philip. Maybe there's somebody else in here who would like to uh, join this church. We invite you to come. Also, there's another part of this invitation, and you can either do it during the singing of, of the hymn, or you can do it uh, after the service is over. We've got just a bunch of cards sitting inside of the altar rail here, and they have various ministries typed on them. We're going to ask you to pray. Pick up one of those cards and pray specifically for that ministry for this next week. Will you do that? Let's stand and sing together. First and last verses only. Diane comes from Willow Glen United Methodist Church in San Jose, California. And so we welcome her to our church this day. Diane, a couple of questions I need to ask you. You heard me ask the same questions of Doug and Amy a little bit earlier. First of all, do you renew your profession of faith in Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life? We be loyal to Christ and allow your loyalty to Christ to find expression right here at Dunwoody United Methodist Church through your prayers, your regular attendance, your financial gifts, your service to the church, and your witness to the world. Will you do that? God bless you. I want to be the first to welcome you into the fellowship of this church. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, to join us at the door and give people a chance to greet you and welcome you. And I want you to know this is part of the congregation, and there's a lot more of the congregation, and we're here to support you. And in your journey and we're counting on you to keep your uh, vows and help us as we uh, as we make our journey of faith as well so dear friends if you will welcome her warmly into the life of the church will you stand and let her know how glad you are that she joined this morning hey when you go from this place go in the knowledge of Christ is going before you beside you He'll be with you every step of the way. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be in you and with you and fill you today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your life.